Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Form Check Friday. Now, this is the series where we take your viewer submitted videos, we put them up on the screen behind me, and I offer my best advice possible to try to help people become more efficient, better power lifters. Uh, if you're interested in submitting, you can go ahead and click the annotation on screen right now. We have a video with our submission guidelines where you can uh, find out the best way to submit things should you be interested in having us look at them. Now, uh, we're going to start off today with a video from Ben. Now, Ben, uh, we left off with Ben's bench last time. Um, ben is a self-ascribed gym bro. And uh, he says he's looking to get into powerlifting. So uh, this is 185 for five. And he's thinking maybe his grip is too close. And I think right off the hop, that's going to be the first thing uh, that I would probably work on is not necessarily saying like, oh, if you go wider, you're going to be a better lifter. You're going to lift more, you know, range of motion is everything. But if we can get you to experiment a little bit wider, there's a decent chance that trimming that range of motion. I mean, right now, if we look at it, your grip is here and the rings are out here. Now, most power lifters in light to medium light to medium weight classes are gonna have their first finger here. So their hand's gonna be way out here. So you're looking at like almost a full hand and a couple fingers widths, wherein you have some room to at least play around with. A lot of times if we can trim that range of motion, that's gonna be a really big help uh, in terms of making sure that, you know, you can see that you're having to kind of pull your trunk down and go into a little bit of sort of upper black upper back flexion to try to get that bar to touch because you're good you're demanding so much range of motion on the shoulders so if you can take it a little bit easier on the shoulders by you know going through a little bit less range of motion um, then in a lot of cases you're gonna be able to do a little bit more work and you may just feel stronger and more stable right off the hop so uh, it's definitely something worth checking out at the very least um, and there were a, a large number of comments um, on our last video where we left off here talking about moving that grip out a little bit wider uh, one more thing before we get into the next lifter I did want to mention uh, new year Calgary Barbell is going to be um, coming out with some different tiers for our coaching. We also have our intern, Derek, has undergone uh, almost a half a year, so about six months of working with clients under our guidance. Um, now, he's a master's student. He's working with both my, Dr. Mike Israetel and Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, so we're really, really happy to have Derek on the team. Derek, Danny, and Taylor all have slots available for online coaching. Um, there will be a link in the description below. You can head to calgarybarbell.com and check out some of our options there. At the very least, reach out and ask some questions. So if you're interested in coaching, you like what you see here, go ahead and hit us up. Now, our next lifter today is going to be May. Uh, now, this is May's first submission. Uh, she says when she deadlifts, she has no discomfort, uh, nothing like that to, to worry about. Um, but she is concerned that perhaps her stance is a little bit too wide or her toes are pointed out too much. Now, unfortunately, from this angle, it's very hard to see um, what this looks like uh, in terms of width, right? Because we can see, um, you know, sort of a good... We can get a really good idea of timing of the sumo deadlift from the side angle, but it's tough to see, okay, are our feet too wide? Are our knees too wide? What are those angles looking like? It's really tough to tell from here. So I unfortunately can't give you too much guidance on that. But what I can say is we're noticing that when we start here, there's a pretty distinct rise in the hip, right? We can see things shifting um, as you begin the lift. So to me, that tells me that A, we're not pulling the slack out of the bar too much uh, or, or enough rather. And B, we could probably be a little bit more patient off the floor. So the first thing I'm going to advise is don't bring your hips down quite so low. I think when we put our hips so low, we're going into a lot of extension, which is something that you mentioned as well. Now, a little bit of extension is not necessarily a bad thing at all, um, but you can see that that kind of flattens out as we start the lift. So we're starting with more extension as the hips come up and we get pulled forward, we get into a little bit less extension. So there is a change in the back angle, which is representative of potentially a bit of a power leak or a loss of uh, some of the rigidity and, and bracing that we strive for when we're deadlifting. So I would probably start the hips a little bit higher. And one of the ways I would coach that is try to keep your knees a little bit further back, right? Imagine there's, there's kind of a wall just in front of the bar. So, you know, if this is the bar here, 
and we're looking at this dead on from the side. If your knees come over in front of the bar, that's not a big deal, but if your knees come way over in front of the bar, that's when we're gonna be sitting the butt down too low, knees too far forward, and then as you can see, when we start the lift, the hips shoot back and we get pulled forward here. So, number one, keep the hips back, keep the knees back just a little bit to give yourself a stronger and more consistent start position. Number two, when you start the lift, I want you to think about pushing the floor away much more so than pulling back on the bar. So once we've achieved a good brace and a good sort of pulling the slack out of the bar, once we've achieved a good start position, we want to use the tension we create by sort of levering ourselves against the bar and think about pushing the floor away. An ideal scenario, we're going to have knee extension being the driving movement. Now we can see this is a bit of a better rep here but we're still getting the hips shooting up behind you. So if we're in a really good start position, the hips should pretty much maintain their angle and the knee will extend. We'll go from here to here to here, right? Knee extension. And what that'll do is it'll drive us pretty much straight up and it'll have a more or less vertical bar path. What's happening here is when the hips shoot up, the bar pulls us out forward. We see that bar getting out ahead of our center of gravity and we might be losing a little bit of tension in the upper back and some of those kinds of things. So be a little bit more patient, learn to pull the slack out of the bar and initiate the bar by, or initiate the lift rather, by pushing the floor away and trying to maintain your torso angle so that it's not changing as we start the lift. And I hope that helps for you. Our next lifter here is gonna be Brandon. So Brandon is doing some squats here obviously he says he loves powerlifting and long walks on the beach <laughs> uh he's a competitive power lifter but he feels like his squat is holding him back so he says he competes at 85 kilos or thereabouts uh and his top end squat is 250 kilos which i think is a pretty damn respectable squat um he says that if his he feels like his form is off but it doesn't feel bad at all um, so he's wondering if he could get a little bit of critique, if we can sort of pick anything out uh, that might help him kind of, you know, distill down to uh, maybe something a little bit more e efficient. So there's a few things I'm seeing. And number one, looks like we're really, really wide in that sort of knee angle, in, in the angle of the upper leg. And what happens a lot of the times if we're, if we're pushing our knees out perhaps too far on the way down, we're going to see the knees sort of crash in as we come back up. And a lot of the times when the knees crash in like that, we see the hips shoot up behind us, it puts us into that sort of classic squat morning pattern. Now we do see a little bit of that as you come out of the hole, right? We see those knees shift inward. We see ourselves get pulled forward, even just slightly. And I wonder if a more moderate stance and more moderate angle of the femur wouldn't be a little bit better. So instead of pushing your knees out so aggressively on the way down, the first thing I would, I would try is just kind of let the knees track where they want to track. So if right now we're pushing them out and they're here, if we kind of let them do their thing and they're here, they're probably going to be more closely lined up to where they're going to be on the way back up, which means we're not going to get that shift, which means ideally we're not going to see that moment of looseness as we change direction out of the bottom. And you can see here, we do have that moment of looseness. We do kind of get that sticking point as a result of that. The other thing I would do is maybe play around with your bar position because I can see the shoulders shrug just slightly, the bar pulls forward on you. Uh, however slightly, I mean, some of these things are gonna be fixable over time using self-limiting exercises, things like pause squats and pin squats, but other things, you know, if we can slightly adjust perhaps what we're doing with our grip or where the bar position is, then we can limit that little bit of bar roll out of the bottom. Now that bar roll might be a sort of chicken and the egg situation with that knee cave, that loss of tightness for a moment. So it's tough to say, you know, what's, what's causing what there. One might be a symptom of the other, but I would say investigate both of those things and see if we can't tighten up that bar position as we change directions as well. A lot of the times, you know, we see this on a single at, I would say this is about an eight, you know, somewhere in that 90 to 93% range. But it's gonna be a lot more evident when we get to heavier weights. You know, if this is a single at an eight or something like that, it's gonna be a lot more evident at heavier weights that we're, you know, seeing these faults kind of creep through and, and they're becoming more of a, uh, more of a thing. So yeah, if we can nail these things down when they're slight, then hopefully that carries over in the long run. 
All right, our next lift comes from Marius. Now Marius uh, is doing some bench press here. He says he's 18 years old. He's been lifting two years uh, and that his bench is improving. One of the things he accredits that to is the fact that he's been eating a lot. So good on you. For anybody out there who is young, just getting into the sport, um, you know, eating in a lot of cases, uh, in some cases, gaining a little bit of weight can really, really help the bench. So don't overlook your nutrition, um, you know, really for any lift. Anytime you're trying to get stronger, you know, I saw a good post the other day. Somebody was talking about how, I think it was David Wilson. Uh, and he was talking about how a lot of lifters will say like, oh, I'll do absolutely anything to get stronger. But, you know, tracking your macros is just too hard. You know, paying attention to your nutrition, like, mm, ooh, I don't know. But I'll do anything. And it's like, well... You know, a little bit of a uh, little bit of a discrepancy there. So yeah, don't underestimate nutrition when it comes to your ability to get better at these things. Anyways, getting back to the point here, uh, he weighs 154 pounds. He says, and this is 225 for a set of three. So first off, good on you, man. Um, that's way more than I was benching when I was that age. So um, you're already winning in that in that sense. So what we're seeing here is a pretty classic sort of novice bencher. Um, scenario. So we're doing a really good job until about here. At this point, we can see, see how the elbow kind of flares out as we go into the touch. Now, a lot of the times that's because the touch maybe should have been pulled down a little bit further, further. the elbows should have stayed in coming down this way. Um, but I like to conceptualize it thinking about that there, there's a kind of bubble on the chest. And this is really evident in a bench shirt, but there's a bubble on the chest. Um, I'll make myself a bit bigger here so you can see. There's a bubble on the chest, say from like here to here. And a lot of times the bar is gonna come to here. And what uh, what Marius here is doing is he's coming back this way. So he's flaring out and allowing the bar to touch up here. As opposed to pulling it into that tension, reaching the chest up and trying to use that bubble because that bubble is kind of the path of most resistance. And when we're talking about the descent on the bench, we want to get into that bubble. We want to pull it in, pull the chest up and get into that position where we're going to be the most explosive and have the most pop off the chest. Um, so it's likely that he's feeling some resistance there. And instead of pulling in and getting tighter into the touch, he's kind of dumping it. And you can see there, the leg drive lapses, the elbows flare out, the bar path is kind of wonky. So we need to tighten things up. We need to get more comfortable on the chest. And I talk about this all the time in these form check Fridays. Do your pauses, do your pause work, get comfortable with the bottom position in the bench, spend some time with that bar on the chest in an isometric contraction, not a pause where you come down and, and just like relax the bar into your chest and go, Ugh and then press, that's not a pause bench. Um, come down, touch the shirt with control. And when I say touch the shirt, I just mean you don't need to like slam it into your chest. Now, again, you know, we've talked about the whole uh, sink and heave versus constant tension bench. We've talked about that kind of stuff a lot, but um, what I'm saying here is we just need more control in the bottom. Cause there's, again, like we were talking about with um, Brandon squat, is there's a lapse of tightness. There's a loss of tightness as we change directions. So if we can create tightness in the bottom, we're gonna be a lot better suited to finish the lift off the chest, to be able to come off the chest well and with a good bar path and in control of the bar, as opposed to kind of ignoring the bottom of the range of motion, skipping it because it's hard or, you know, otherwise just losing control. So we can see here, the shoulders are getting shrugged up. The elbows are flaring out um, quite a bit from the touch which tells me, you know, one of two things. Either we need to keep things tucked a little bit as we press, or we need to come down into the bottom with a little bit more flare. In either case, we want to avoid these huge movements in the elbows. We want to have a nice smooth touch and press where we get this smooth flare out of the bottom instead of tuck, wing, and then press kind of thing. And lastly, I would try to work more on leg drive. Try to make sure that your legs are on the whole time, not that you're just using them when you go to, to press the bar off the chest, right? It's like your legs are kind of there and then, whoa, we decide we want to use them as we touch. Use those legs the whole time, man. As soon as you pull that bar out of the rack, full power, full tilt. Squeeze those glutes, kick the floor away this way, push yourself back on the bench to reinforce your arch and keep those legs on the whole time. All right. Next up, we have Cook, 
doing some deadlifts here. And Cook says he's from Thailand. So first off, shout out to Thailand. Uh, 68 kilos body weight. Uh, he says grip is his big issue. Um, he says his grip is a bit wide in the video, um, but he's doing that in order to get his hands on the knurling. So he's a pretty slight guy and he's trying to make sure that, uh, make sure everybody can see that. Yeah. Uh, he's trying to make sure that he can, you know, have some knurling to hold on to. So number one, this looks like a commercial gym bar. So that puts you at a bit of a disadvantage right off the hop. The knurling's probably not very aggressive. Um, in, a, in most commercial gym settings, the bars are going to be pretty used. Um, I've been to a few, um, you know, box gyms around Canada where it feels like somebody went in the morning of and, and took uh, a sander to the bars and then oiled them. So <laughs> it, it may or may not be a grip strength thing. It may be somewhat dependent on the equipment you're using. I would say make sure you're using chalk if you can. It doesn't look like you have any chalk on there. Again, one of the downfalls of a commercial gym, maybe you can use chalk, maybe you can't. Um, you know, maybe that's a discussion you can have with somebody at some point. The other thing when it comes to training grip strength is honestly, they ain't nothing to it but to do it. If you wanna get better at grip in your deadlifts, do things like this and hold, hold for longer. It'll also get you good at lockout balance for your sumo deadlift. When you get to the top, hold it for five or six seconds. For your, you know, once you're done your back off work or on the last rep of each of your back off sets, hold it for like 10 seconds. Like it's a very specific skill to get good at grip on the deadlift. And if you incorporate more deadlift grip training, it logically follows and, and you know, we have the tools to know that this will transfer over. Uh, if you grip your deadlifts, you will get better at gripping your deadlifts. That's, I mean, the long and short of it. In terms of the deadlift itself, again, I think we could pull the slack out a little bit more. You can see this, this relatively evident shift out of the bottom. We pull in and then we see this kind of leading up of the hips. We can see the knees cave in a little bit. So that tells me we might be able to bring the stance in a tiny bit because we're, we're getting this sort of, uh, if you're looking at it from the front, it's gonna look more like this with the shin angle and then into the, the lifter here, um, as opposed to having a little bit more of an upright shin angle from the front. Now, obviously this lifter is very lopsided, but you get the point. Generally speaking, we wanna have relatively vertical shin angle when we look at the lifter from the front. Um, and, and a lot of cases that's going to um, be limited by hip anatomy, flexibility, things like that. A lot of people ask me like, oh, you know, I'm having trouble breaking the bar off the floor. What mobility, what stretches can I do? And it's like, well, you could just set up better. Um, <laughs> you know, so I, I think it's a lot of times getting into a good starting position is just playing to your anatomy, figuring out how your body needs to move, not necessarily trying to emulate somebody else you've seen or, or to maximize leverages. Like you can only maximize the leverages that you're born with. You can't change your leverages. So you have to play to your strength. In this case, uh, cook, I would say try and go a little bit more narrow in your stance and I think that'll help you get into a bit of a stronger position off the floor. Also, same thing I was telling um, May is, you know, keep those knees back just a little bit more. You can see when you pull into this bottom position, the knees are forward and then they kind of shoot back a little bit while the hips shoot up and then we get into a, a decent position to start the pull from. So just something else to keep in mind. All right, next up we have Henry. So now Henry is, uh, is doing some squats here as well. Uh, he says he's a former high school football player, plans to compete eventually. Um, as most people were, I think he said he was uh, kind of derailed and had really inconsistent uh, access to the gym during the last little while with lockdowns and, and all those kinds of things. Uh, this is about 90% for a triple. And he says he's got a few things that he thinks about himself pretty constantly. Um, so number one, he says he thinks a lot about his elbows and where they should be throughout the movement. Uh, and number two, he says he kind of thinks a lot about uh, or, or obsesses or he's even compulsive, he says, uh, over his bar position. So he says he's got a sticking point about halfway up and he wants to know if I can or we can identify anything there that, uh, you know, he could do to, to better his squat. So I'm going to let this play through one last time. And what I'd like is for everybody to head down into the comments section below, leave your thoughts 
on what our good friend Henry can do to better his squat and um, you know leave some constructive criticism let us know what you see down there and I'm gonna start next week's form check Friday episode with Henry's squat so you all can see how I see things all right I want to thank everybody for sitting through today uh, for hanging out with me I hope you're all enjoying um, to whatever extent you can whatever conditions you're in so take it easy and we'll see y'all next week for form check Friday bye bye <laughs>